Good evening, everyone. It's really good to be here this evening, and particularly to be in Clonard Monastery. Uh, Steve wrote a blog the other day which put me under a lot of pressure. If you read it, don't believe half of it. Uh, and, uh, but it's really nice to be here with that sort of pressure. It was 25 years ago that I first spoke at Clonard Monastery. Uh, it has a special place in my heart because when you're thinking about forgiveness and repentance, uh, it was the first place ever as a good Baptist that I was ever ashed because I was here on Ash Wednesday. Uh, and I spoke at one of the co-fraternities, and the pressure's back in you, if you read what Steve said about me coming here this evening. That night I spoke, I got a standing ovation from about 700 men in the co-fraternity. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking for the same love when I finish this evening. Uh, but it really is good to be here this evening and to reflect with you on your theme. There's been a part of grumpy old man as I prepared to come here because I thought back in all our times in Akonai, and I thought about Stanley Harwas coming and talking about a time to heal, about Gregory Jones coming from Duke University, talking about embodying forgiveness. I remembered the forgiveness papers we produced, 15 of them between 2001 and 2003. The conference in 2002, forgiveness making a world of difference. The Catherwood lecture with Donald Shriver, a professor from Union Theological College in New York on forgiveness and ethic for enemies. And I thought, what more is there to say? Because if you look at all those papers and resources on the Akonai website, or the Center for Contemporary Christianity website, there are thousands of words that written by just one organization on the theme of forgiveness as it relates to this topic in Northern Ireland. And yet here we are, all those years later, and we still cannot find a way to talk to each other about the harm that we did for each other over 40 years. We no longer have that vocabulary, despite our high practice of Christian faith and our commitment to follow in the way of the one who, while we were still his enemies, loved us and died for us and bought our forgiveness. It's probably about the only narrative that keeps me conservative in my theology when I look at what's going on in the world, because it's the only way I can make sense of evil and of suffering is in the sacrifice of Christ and the forgiveness he won for us. My journey in forgiveness took another leap forward when I went to Coventry Cathedral uh, just over 10 years ago, because the Coventry narrative of forgiveness is rather stark. There, embedded on the walls of the cathedral, are the simple words, Father, forgive. Words that were uttered within weeks of the devastation of Coventry in November 1940 in the Blitz. Words that were lived out in reaching out to Germany in 1945 and 1946, to places like Dresden and to Hamburg and Lübeck, and taking the Coventry Cross of Nails from the ruins of the cathedral as a symbol of commitment to reconciliation. And that journey at Coventry, why the words Father forgive, not forgive them, but forgive all of us for this mess that we've made of your world, those words and those actions spoke to the complexity that is forgiveness. One of the interesting things that I used to challenge my colleagues at Coventry about was there was a sense that their journey of forgiveness was a lot easier than ours. At the end of the Second World War, there was, at one level, no doubt about who the bad guys were, and they lost comprehensively. It was unconditional surrender. And in that context, going with the magnanimity of forgiveness and it being received because there was nothing else for a people who were totally bereft and at a loss, the power dynamics in forgiveness became at one level quite straightforward, although complex, as we shall see. Whereas here, if we're honest about it, nobody's really won. We fought ourselves to a standstill. And there are two challengingly competing narratives about the moral framework about which we understand what happened over the last 40 years. And neither of them is dominant. And therefore, forgiveness becomes profoundly difficult and complex as to 
how it's offered, who receives it, and how that reception goes about in the life of a community. And so with all of that sort of bearing on me coming to this evening, I, I simply want to hone in on, on what I hope are three very simple things. Because it seems to me that we lose our sense of forgiveness, or we even make it more prob problematic than what it should be, because we divorce it from the actual norm of Christian living. We talk about it as something that is out there, as a concept, an idea, a process, a transaction that we need to get through because of hurt and pain and so on. And yet, when we just stop to think about it, forgiveness, it is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. You cannot not be a follower of Jesus without forgiveness being at the heart of the narrative. And so I, I simply want to focus in on three very clear principles about Christian living in which I think forgiveness is totally wrapped up in, in how we take it forward. And alongside those three principles, I want to tell three stories, which I'm sorry they're not going to be nice stories that the bow on them that ties it off. They're going to point to the complexity of what this forgiveness thing looks like. And then having been billed as somebody who thinks biblically, I better finish up with a sort of a reflection of what I think biblical forgiveness means and looks like. The first thing I want to say about forgiveness is that forgiveness is intrinsic to walking in the light of Christ. You know, John makes this very clear in his letter in that very first chapter that forgiveness is at the heart of what it means to walk in the light of Jesus. Because the light of Jesus illuminates the fact that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The narrative of Jesus illuminates the fact that the human narrative is anything but pleasing to God and falls short of his glory in how we live. And that narrative invites us into a relationship with God through forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And yet how hard is it for those who claim to follow Jesus closest to live that out in our willingness to confess our sins? And it's partly a liturgical problem, having been brought up Irish Presbyterian, having worshipped in a Baptist church, and I find myself right at the heart of Church of England liturgy. Uh, and it's true in a place like this. You know, it's interesting how many of the non-conformist traditions don't have a place for public confession of sin. And a priest doesn't stand up in front of you and say your sins are forgiven. And when you're trying to do it for yourself in your head, forgiveness becomes really quite complex. The hardest bit of walking in the light of Christ and his forgiveness is finding the grace to live with ourselves. It's not what other people have done to us, but who we are. Because only we know who we are. And that terrible petition, I can remember Fred Catherwood talking about this when he came to do the first Catherwood lecture in, in Belfast, the series that we named after him in his honor. The terrible petition of Jesus, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who <coughs> sin against us. That is why forgiveness is just the warp and woof of Christian living. You can't live as a Christian without forgiving. You can't not forgive and experience forgiveness yourself. We are forgiven and a forgiving people. It's a fundamental fact. David Stevens goes to the heart of this when he talked about the need to redeem relationships in one of his books on reconciliation and deal with the past as well as to have new and transformed structures. He concluded by saying we need to become different people. We need to be converted. And the Christian journey is a daily journey of conversion, where we know what it is to confess our sins before God. And because God is faithful and just and has said he will forgive us our sins, he forgives us our sins. And we walk in that light, and that totally transforms everything as we will see in a moment in my next two points. But first, a story. In two days' time, we will commemorate the, the story that Coventry is most associated with and which resonates with this part of the world because of Ray Davies' experience in Dresden and the bombing of Dresden in February 1945. 
But most of us probably haven't heard of the bombing of a town called Fontsheim 10 days later on the 23rd of February, 1945. 18,000 were killed on that night. Uh, not as many as Dresden, but proportionally for the size of the town, absolutely devastating. Five days after the bombing of Fontsheim, a Lancaster plane was flying a reconnaissance mission over that area, taking pictures to see how devastating the bombing would be. And it was hit by flak. And it began hurtling towards the ground, and the pilot, a certain man called John Wynne, was uncertain whether he was going to be able to land. So he encouraged his crewmates, five of them, to bail out, having thought they'd already crossed the Rhine, and therefore they would be safe. Uh, they bailed out. He actually flew on and actually made it back to England and landed the plane. But they landed on the wrong side of the Rhine, in a little town called Huckenfeld, just outside of Fontsheim. One of the most moving things I ever had to do was stand in that town of Huckenfeld and lay a wreath on the grave of a young boy who died in that bombing eight-year-old and a young girl who was 12 who died in the bombing on behalf of John Wynne. Now, how did I come to be there laying that reef on behalf of Flight Lieutenant John Wynne? Those five young men from his plane landed in a town that was very bruised and very angry. It was threatened. The war was coming to an end. They were going to lose. They'd just been seen the town nearest them partly obliterated and lots of the people in the village killed, including these two young children. And they grabbed these five men, took them off to a barn, and it became very evident very quickly that they were going to be shot, put up against the wall and shot, against all the rules of war and conflict. Such was the anger. Two of them managed to escape. Three of them were put against the wall and shot by a group of Hitler youth who had been given rifles. After the war, there was a short inquiry into this, but otherwise, it was all covered up until the early 1990s, when a pastor from East Germany, having been reunited, went to the church in Huckenfeld to minister and discerned very quickly that there was something toxic in the life of the village and the life of the church that they weren't talking about. And he eventually got them to talk about the story of what had happened to these five young airmen at the hands of these Hitler youth, some of whom were still living in the village, and therefore it was their story as well. And he got in touch with Coventry Cathedral and the infamous Paul Ostreicher, who was my predecessor in the cathedral at that time, and so began a reconciliation process for that village, where they learned to forgive themselves. And in the middle of that, they discovered that the two young men had escaped, were still alive, obviously well on in years. And they brought them back to the village for a service of reconciliation and forgiveness, where tears were said on both sides for the bombing and for the killings. Because whatever we think what happened in the war, our bombing strategy in Germany was never justified by any moral rationale at all. And that story carried in the Guardian newspaper. And a certain John Wynne, by this point, had retired from the RAF and was a sheep farmer in Lumbetter in Wales. He thought all his colleagues had got home safe. He had never heard of them after the war, never heard from them. And suddenly he discovered the story. And he went to Huckenfeld and twinned his village of Lumbetter in Wales with Huckenfeld in Germany. And at the heart of that twinning is an exchange programme between the primary schools and a rocking horse called Hofnon, Hope. I've got a wonderful picture riding Hofnon, uh, which looks rather weird, this large man and this little children's rocking horse. <laughs> but at the heart of John Wynne's journey back to Hockenfeld was a deep penitence for his part in the bombing of German cities. It was about the village learning to live with itself and to forgive itself. It was about British air crew learning to live with themselves and to forgive themselves. And that was the challenge of Christian reconciliation and forgiveness.
walking in the light that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not only is forgiveness about walking in the light, it's also about walking in love. If we read John's letter to the church, 1 John, the whole premise of Christian fellowship and about God being love is about how we journey with each other in forgiveness towards each other. It is about the communal aspect of loving one another in a way, as Lewis Meads, the ethicist, says, love makes forgiving a creative violation of all the rules for keeping score. You see, forgiveness becomes a normal part of who we are as Christians if we're walking in the love of God. It's not something outside of us. It's not a problem to be solved, a process to be carried out. It's just part of walking in the love of God because we too are experiencing that love and experiencing that love of God that helps us to live with one another. Let's face it, just take a look around at everyone and all the people that you've got to know through church or are getting to know through this Four Corners Festival. Some of those combinations you would never dream of having in your life at all, sure you wouldn't. You know, the only reason you're together is because of the love of God. And the only reason that you're able to stay together is because that love of God covers a multitude of sins in our relationships. And so forgiveness is about love, not just walking in the light of God, but walking in the love of God. Another story, Father Leonard Roth, you probably have never heard of him. He was a Dominican priest who was interned in Dachau between 1943 and 45 for opposing the Nazi regime, German priest. What he's most renowned for is when the camp was liberated, he volunteered to stay on to be the priest to the SS men of the camp who were then interred in the camp and other members of the SS who were brought there to be kept for their trials at Nuremberg. He stayed as their priest between 1945 and 1948. Having suffered at their hands, he showed the love of God by caring for them as their pastor and as their priest. He then stayed on for a further period of 12 years between 48 and 60 when Dachau became a resettlement camp for Germans who had been displaced from Eastern Germany to the West at the end of the war. And he acted as their curate and became a campaigner for Dachau not to be obliterated, which some of them wanted, but to be kept to memorial as to what happened there. Because forgiveness doesn't mean that you forget. It means that you learn to walk in love with one another. And at the moment when the Bavarian government and the new West German government agreed that they would make Dachau a national memorial, Father Leonard Roth went into a forest and took an overdose and killed himself. Why? Because the church authorities had opposed the memorial, as had the Bavarian government. He was seen as a thorn in their flesh. And they circulated a rumor that he was in the camp not because he was a priest, but because he was homosexual. And therefore, at the moment that he got what he was campaigning for, he took his own life. Even walking together as the people of God in the most extremes of suffering and the challenge of forgiveness is complex. There are no easy answers, just pain. And my final point is that Christians were not only called to walk in the light of God and walk in the love of God, but we are invited to share in the life of God. God is life-giving. God invites us to choose life over the cult of death that dominates our world. God invites us to set aside vengeance and revenge, to have a hard telling, to tell it as it was. These stories need to be told. One of my other favourite memories of Clonard is this was the only place shortly after the ceasefires and before the Belfast Agreement where I was able to shout at senior members of the Republican movement and get away from, with it down in Parlour 4. Normally about midnight when our patients got a bit thin at the end of a long evening of haggling over what was the way forward. And if Tom Hartley was here, he would say, yes, that was my unionist gut coming out. But it was a hard telling but it was also an honest remembering. Wherever you draw the line in this community, all of us are complicit. We're all not culpable, which was something I was very insistent on when we did 
dealing with the past and the consultative group in the past, because those who made the moral choice to pick up a gun or plant a bomb, they're culpable for that. But all of us are complicit, as Stocky himself wrote a song for a, a Conai Road show in which it said, you may not have uh, pulled the trigger, but did you point your heart? And that's what makes us all complicit in this mess that is Northern Ireland, which is going to get even more complex with Brexit. As Mark Amstead says when he came to that conference for Conai, forgiveness seeks to create a new beginning out of the ashes of injustice. It is forgiveness that helps us deal with the past in moral ways, to manage continuing political conflict which draws its energy from the past and to envision the future. In that sense, uh, Desmond Tutu is right. There is no future without forgiveness. It's at the heart of the life that God invites us to share with him. To choose life is to choose forgiveness because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We look for those miracles and cures and healing wells. And my final story. There was rebellion in Ireland. When has there not been rebellion in Ireland? In the 1640s. And a particular Anglo-Irish family found itself slightly in the wrong side of that dividing line of the rebellion. The patriarch of the family had marched north with a small militia to join forces with others and left behind his heavily pregnant wife. But the rebellious forces were drawing nearer to their big house and she decided to make a run with it with a few of the household servants. They got to the bridge to discover that the rebels had already taken it. They headed up the river to cross a ford and halfway across, a small group of rebels caught up with them. They were going to pull her from her horse, kill her, rip her open, because she was heavily pregnant. And she begged with them and pleaded with them and said, if you let me go free, this child, particularly if it's a boy, I will bring it up to be a child that will step beyond all of this conflict and all of this vengeance. And she pleaded with them and her commitment for the future, a different sort of future than what was being enacted out in front of her. And they did. They let her go. And 400 years later, the great, 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 great grandson of her and that child was sitting in his office one day in Whitehall where he held the position of Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Peter Brook, when a senior MI6 officer who was about to retire came into his office and said, uh, Mr Brook, can I please have permission to reopen the channel with folks up in Derry? Because I think there might be something that might be of interest. And Peter Brook, who we all remember as sort of like stumbling, sort of hesitant Secretary of State, picked up all his courage and went to see Margaret Thatcher in the final days of her premiership and said, Prime Minister, can I please authorise Michael Lookley to reopen the communication channel with Derry? And Maggie said, yes, there you go. And the rest, as we know, is history in terms of our peace process. But the reason Peter Brook was able to do that was that the challenge of Northern Ireland was not just an intellectual exercise, it was who he was. It was his family's story. He was a part of a family that chose to walk on the other side of revenge and vengeance and to live life in the way that God invites us to. So finally, biblical forgiveness for me is moving from the transactional to the relational. I really have lost patience with these arguments. Who repents first? Who offers the forgiveness first? That transactional understanding of it, forget it. That's not what I see in the New Testament. I see forgiveness as living in the light, living in love and choosing the life of God. Forgiveness enables redeeming, not forgetting. This pain and the pain of many in this community has to be remembered. The pain that I'm increasingly becoming aware of, 300,000 British soldiers served here over the 40 years. They are the forgotten deployment in the light of Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and many of them live now in their 60s and 70s with post-traumatic stress from having been in the streets of Belfast and nobody's doing anything for them. The British, as in all countries, are not that good at looking after their soldiers in later life and that needs to be remembered, not forgotten and it needs to be redeemed in our relationships 
And biblical forgiveness elicits repentance as a step towards reconciliation. It isn't reconciliation. It does not require repentance, but it is the offer of forgiveness from God in Christ that elicits repentance from us. It is because we already know we are loved and forgiven that we are free to confess our sins because he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Not because I'm about to sign a transaction with him. As Martin Luther King said, forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a permanent attitude. Thank you.